Greetings, I'm Audrey Tang, Taiwan's Digital Minister. I'm really happy to be here virtually to share with you some thoughts around reimagining democracy. Our President, Dr. Tsai Ing-wen, in her inauguration three years ago, said, Before, we think of democracy as a showdown between two opposing values. But from now on, democracy must become a conversation between many diverse values. Indeed, in traditional thinking, people representing technological advances on one side, as well as people representing social justice on the other, or people thinking about economic prosperity on one side, and people thinking about environmental sustainability on the other, are kind of the different knots with the different representatives, MPs, ministers, with the civil service in between as they vote. However, nowadays, with hashtags, Hashtag Me Too, hashtag Climate Strike can mobilize tens of millions of people who are of very different sectors, very different background toward a common cause. And in this way, there really is no way for the traditional bureaucracy in a top-down way to find out who are the representatives and what trade-offs to make. Rather, we need to ask a different set of questions. We need to ask, given our various positions, are there still some common values? And given the common values, are there innovations that can deliver on those common values without leaving anyone worse off? So this is my office, the Social Innovation Lab in Taiwan. Anyone can come here and talk to me for 40 minutes at a time under the idea of radical transparency. Every Wednesday, it's my office hour. And so anyone can come to me with new innovations that they want to try out with the society to build and design the social norms. Here are some self-driving tricycles from MIT Media Lab. They came to me two years ago saying, Minister, would you like to ride on one even though we're still working on it? It bumps into things all the time. I'm like, are you sure? And they're like, this is really slow. So if it bumps into people, if it bumps into buildings, there's no harm done. It's not even as fast as the person running. I'm like, OK. So what are these things being useful? They're like, no, let's just have a hackathon. Let's just ask the people nearby what to make use of it. And that is a norm first approach. We invited people around the Social Innovation Lab nearby the Jianguo Flower Market. So there's an elderly couple that walks from the Jianguo Flower Market with lots of pots of flowers. And they said, hey, minister, what are you doing with those shopping carts? I'm like, these are not really shopping carts. And they're like, they look like just like shopping cart. And so can we put our orchid flower there? And so they started brainstorming and imagined a way that these self-driving tricycles can follow them around on the flower market and they can just put the flowers into it. And once they're done shopping, maybe the vehicle is full, the vehicle can summon another one for them to continue to the jade market, which is also nearby. And by the end of it, they can hop on one, and they will just drive them home. But to make these changes is actually very difficult to imagine from Boston. It does take the Taipei Tech, as well as many different people around the hackathon site, to change the hardware, to change the software, to analyze the data. But fortunately, because these are open source, open hardware, and open data, it equips everybody with the capability to tinker to hack, to fork these designs into something that's embraced by the society. And with these social norms firmly in place, then we can design the market policies. We can design then the technological architectures to protect what people treasure. And then finally, maybe laws and regulation. So here you're looking at a real um, right with these self-driving tricycles with me on it. And you can witness that there's two eyes that can read emotional responses from people. You can read hand gestures and it can also emote back. So this kind of co-domestication is much preferred than a top-down approach of imposing these technologies into people's lives. So in sustainable development goal terms, this is 1717, is about building partnerships across different sectors. We have another design called Presidential Hackathon that emphasizes the flexibility of the bureaucracy. 
anyone working in public sector or private or academia or social sector can go and submit an idea into this wishing well every April. Last April, there was a repairs people um, in the Taiwan Water Corporation. They maintain one of the longest water pipes in the world. And they say, we're choosing a site called Jilong, and we're going to test a new algorithm. Previously, they hired people to listen to those leaking pipes. And it takes on average two months between a site that's leaking for someone to detect it. And most of the time, those repairs people spend the whole day listening to the pipes that are not leaking. So it's kind of a boring job until they found a leaking point where it becomes creative. Now, their idea is that how about let's build a chatbot. Whenever a repair person wakes up, they can look at their phone, the chapa would say, hey, these are the three nearby sites that may be leaking, and why don't you investigate them first? So after three months of co-creation, they delivered a solution with the help from the private sector, from the academia, from the executive UN, the administration, and they found a formula using deep learning that analyzing the water pressure and flow data, they can actually shorten the detection from two months to two days. Now, after this, they won the presidential hackathon, one of the five teams. Each team received a trophy from our president. But there is no money. There's no prize money. The only thing we design that this trophy is that there is a projector on the bottom. When you turn on the projector, it projects the image of the president handing the trophy to you. This is very useful. If your director general thinks, oh, there's no budget, you just summon the president, and lo and behold, there's budget. If your minister thinks it requires cross-ministerial coordination, you just summon the president, and they'll get a meeting. Because it carries the presidential promise that whatever the people have piloted during those three months, any team with the trophy are guaranteed to have their idea scaled out, deployed to the entire country within the next 12 months. With the presidential promise, many people started brainstorming about ways to improve our society. And indeed, the Water Savior team, because they save water, also visited New Zealand for three more months to co-create a solution, a local AI that fixes the problem for New Zealand, which are just beginning to encounter water shortage because of climate change. So the idea here is that it is not about a top-down approach. This is about a peer-to-peer -peer approach of people donating their data. It could be open government data, open citizen data, open private sector data. And together, this data collaborative's relationship ensures that people hold each other accountable by having a common idea of what is the reliable data around our vicinity, around our air quality, around our water quality, around disaster prevention, and all things like that. So if you go to the datacollaborative.org, there are many, many ways for people to collaborate together using data as a common platform. So one example. In Taiwan, we have this airbox initiative that's entirely initiated by the social sector. People just volunteer to put us very cheap, less than 100 US dollars, airboxes to their balcony, to their school. There's many schools that are having this as environmental um, curriculum, basically donating the PM 2.5 measurements that they have to a common public ledger. And with this public ledger, people can rest assured that nobody can change each other's numbers. And Academia Sinica makes a LAS network that analyzes the air quality based on those citizen science data. Now, with more than 2,000 sites, it actually threatens the legitimacy of our Environmental Protection Agency a few years ago because the EPA, even though have higher precision sites, they are only less than 100 in Taiwan. But the great thing about Taiwan is that the social sector always has higher legitimacy compared to the public sector. And so the public sector always said, OK, we can't beat them. We must join them. So the EPA asks the citizen scientists, where are the places that you wish that there could be an airbox, but they couldn't. Well, it turns out that industrial parks are private property. But it also turns out the public sector owns the labs in the industrial parks. So then the EPA helps them to install the airboxes on the lamps that's owned by the public sector. 
And so this kind of collaboration ensures that the social sector controls the governance of the technology, but the public sector, through the idea of data collaboratives, can fit in the places where people feel there must be a complementary action by the public sector. And so in SDG terms, this is SDG 7.4, which is an educational material using, again, open source and open hardware by people around the world. Anyone can download these boxes, either their hardware schema or their software code, and run it locally and participate in this air quality measurement network. So this year, in the top 10 of presidential hackathon, we have four teams that are a combination of AI and CI. That's assistive intelligence and collective intelligence. So the Airbox team also wrote out a water box that measures the waterways in maybe arable lands. And those lands, because if they have plants on it that pollutes the water, this year we pass a law that a central government can cut the water and electricity supply to those plants. So everybody is incentivized to just buy those very cheap water boxes and install it in the waterways to prove that they're not the one that pollutes. And so using this way, anything that requires the public sector attention, for example, um, telemedicine, telediagnostics, and so on, after trying out for three months for everybody to see, then when it gets the trophy, it means that everybody approves of that idea. We use popular voting in a new voting system called quadratic voting to ensure that it really reflects the social preferences of the stakeholders and the general population. So how do we discover those teams? How do we encourage them to go to the presidential hackathon? Well, it turns out every Wednesday, I have an office hour in Taipei. But every other Tuesday or so, I also have a virtual town hall. The idea is that I travel to the most rural, indigenous, offshore places. And because we in Taiwan have broadband as human right, even in the most remote places, 98% of them now have 10 megabits per second. And even in the top of Yushan, 4,000 meters, the southmost Pacific islands of Dongshan and Taiping, you all have 10 megabits per second. And so when I meet with the local people in the places that they're using to meet, for example, an indigenous um, gathering place or a town hall in the local vicinity, I spent a night or two nights in an ethnographic hanging out with the local people. Because everything is also radically transparent, they want to lobby for their personal interests. Rather, in this kind of meetings, people talk about things of public interest and potential innovations to solve them. However, it's not something that's only local. Using broadband, we connect them to the four municipalities, to people in the social innovation lab, that's 12 different ministries, each one sending a section chief or higher to respond in the here and now to all the inventions, all the ideas, all the innovations that's brought by the local social entrepreneurs. And the great thing about this arrangement is that for the public service, they are no longer anonymous. People can see that they're really brainstorming and figuring out cross-ministerial ways to solve people's problems so they can bond together and form a team in presidential hackathon. And if their ideas doesn't work, if the local people is angry, well, you cannot hit someone over the internet. I'm the only one in the vicinity. And so I absorb all the risk and everybody share the credit. And that is how our social innovation tours encourage people to form data collaboratives. In SDG terms, this is target 16-7, a real-time, not every four years, but a real-time, every couple of weeks way for people to be included in the policymaking process. And sometimes there are just very emerging innovations that basically is not foreseen by the law. And sometimes the MP will take an interest, for example, in fintech, in self-driving vehicles, platform economy. 5G, all those different emerging technologies. So we have both a general regulatory sandbox as well as a specific law-level sandbox for fintech and self-driving vehicles. The idea, very simply put, is that anyone can propose to break the law, to build an alternative of the existing laws and regulations, and try it out for a year. As long as it's not about money laundering or funding terrorism, Everything is fair game from every ministry. 
And when people try out for a year, for example, currently in the National Taiwan University, people are trying out a shared economy, uh, rentable um, e-scooters for a while. So even though it's not legal in the rest of Taiwan, the lawmakers, the regulators can all have one year of witnessing how the social norm gets formed around this new technology. If people think it's a bad idea, well, we thank the investors. We all learn something. However, if people think it's a good idea, then we change the regulation to fit. If the MPs need to deliberate for three years, for four years, that's okay. But the initial proof of concept, including the business model, continue to be legal, whereas everybody else is still illegal. So this is like a limited time monopoly until we figure out how to codify those norms into laws and regulations so that everybody can compete, but only on the platform, on the boundary, under the sandbox, that we figure out that it doesn't hurt the social and environmental sustainability. So how do we actually know if people are okay with it, that people can live with it? Well, we use AI-powered conversations, and this one is called Polis. The Polis design, very simply put, puts your avatar among the people who feel like you on a common objective truth. The objective fact, again, is only attainable by kind of puzzle making from the open government data, open citizen data, private sector data, and so on. But looking at the same facts, for example, this picture was about UberX. Looking at the same facts, you may feel happy. They may feel angry. I may feel relaxed. There's no right or wrong about feelings. But the great thing about including feelings is that then when we brainstorm the ideas in design thinking terms, we're having a simple common how might we go forward question as evidenced by the resonance of people with each other's feelings and then we can ratify them into new regulations. So everybody holding a phone can see a fellow citizen's sentiment. For example, this one is, I think passenger liability insurance is important. You may agree or disagree, but there's no reply button, so there's no room for trolls to play. Now, if you hit agree or disagree, there will be another statement that shows on, and your avatar will gradually move toward the people that share your sentiments. And after three or four weeks of consultation, we always end up like this. And this is the most important part of this slide. If you can only take away one slide, I would like it to be this one. It turns out there's only a few divisive statements, a few ideological statements. But most people agree with most of other people on most of the things, most of the time. So why don't we just table the discussion of the most divisive issues and just put into regulation and policy that people's common feelings across different ideological groups. And using AI analysis, we can find out exactly the principal component of what people feel like and have the best idea be the one that takes care of most people's feelings. And so people crowdsource the agenda that let us measure the success of our policies instead of top-down KPI this is a bottom-up KPI that makes sure that whatever we're addressing is out of the common will of the people. And only in this way can we deliver innovations that are truly delivering on the common understanding and common values among different positions. And so using this Venn diagram of Sustainable Development Goals, my work as Digital Minister is in the middle, the 17th goal that binds the environmental, the social, and the economic together under common data that everybody can form a collaborative, under cross-sectoral international partnerships, and finally, under open innovation that we don't reserve the copyright, the patent, all of those intellectual property, quote-unquote, issues that prevents those ideas, those innovations from becoming truly social innovations for only when the GovTech is based on civic tech can the public sector and the citizens co-work and co-design on common solutions that works for everyone. Now finally, as a conclusion, I'd like to read you my job description, also written three years ago. It goes like this. When we see the Internet of Things, let's make it the Internet of Beings. 
When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear that a singularity is near, let us always remember the plurality is here. Thank you for listening.